Uh, who has actually been to any one of the charrette sessions over the course of the last three days or so? I love it. And that means there's a few hands that haven't been raised, so we have new faces. Is that right? That's good. All right. So therefore, to be nice, I will, uh, in three minutes or less, try to summarize why we're here and what we've been doing and what you're going to see tonight. Uh, in general, a charrette is a way to try to get a lot of planning and maybe design and consensus building done in a short amount of time. And a transportation charrette in particular is very much focused on a core aspect of life, getting around. Uh, fortunately, uh, we as a firm like to think a little bit more broadly, so many of the things you'll see here tonight talk a little bit about how land use interacts with transportation, uh, how retail might uh, thrive, and what kind of impacts maybe uh, residences have in, in a downtown, those kinds of ideas. We try to be cognizant of those issues as we go. We've also been told to think as we talk about the two corridors I'm going to show you tonight, which are King Street from North Hatfield through Damon all the way to Main Street, and then Main Street from maybe about Market all the way through to West Street at Elm uh, at the gates of Smith. We've been asked to think about some other kind of key broader issues. We know, for instance, that there's some zoning recommendations for King Street that have been out there that may be revisited. We know that there's an Amtrak station that may be able to be built uh, near your downtown. And I put my first vote for many reasons, as you might understand today, as close as possible to your downtown as you can get it. Um, we understand that there's indeed a, a large amount of commuter in and out traffic that we need to pay attention to, in particular how Northampton communicates with surrounding communities, Springfield to a large extent, and in particular UMass. And UMass is obviously as its own little city, a, a large source of employment for many folks who live in Northampton. We're also very cognizant of the fact that you know, Northampton is a regional destination for many of its valuable assets, particularly on Main Street. And we recognize that there's opportunities to improve upon those and that we don't want to ruin a lot of what works very, very well. What we do realize as we go around the country and do work similar to this is that over time, communities have been able to demonstrate that a real strong mix of uses, active storefronts, walkable downtown environments are A, what sells, B, what reduces overall vehicle volume, and C, what helps keep communities stable, keeps a lot of their activity right in their home communities. And we want to continue to try to promote that kind of success in Northampton and build upon what has worked well while being cognizant of what we're finding are a certain number of threats and concerns. Um, with that as background, tonight is the sort of the summary presentation of what we've been able to intensely try to draw model, uh, theorize about, discuss with many stakeholders who are in the room and who haven't been able to make it tonight but who've been participating in yesterday, which is a lot of studio sessions and the day before where we did a lot of walking on the corridor to begin to understand the problems and document folks' needs in a needs set, uh, assessment workshop on Monday night. So what you're going to see here today is some Pretty pictures, some not so pretty pictures, some ideas. Uh, ultimately, it'll all be documented in a, in a report to the city to be able to have. Uh, my name is Jason Schreiber. I'm a principal of Nelson Nygaard out of Boston, Massachusetts. We are helped by Rick Chelman. He's a professional engineer out of our Boston office. And Michael Alba, who is still feverishly doing some of our last minute work, uh, who helps us in our multimodal group out of Boston. Uh, I'm going to run through the slides. Wayne's going to dim the front set of lights here so we can see what's going on. Um, one thing that's really great about a charrette is input, is being able to hear from folks and listen to what they have to say, because that really guides us. And in many processes, we have a public hearing, you only get to hear the few people who come to the mic. This is all about listening to everybody and anybody who had something to say about this. Look over our shoulders or talk to us, or in the case of Monday night, provide a whole bunch of comments on a map of these corridors. And these comments, I'm going to start working from north to south um, along King, are very good because they let us know what the tenor of folks' impressions of their front doors 
along both King and Main Street are. And please remember, streets are oftentimes, especially in a city, the most commonly used front doors, front yards, open spaces that you could ever have. Um, you know, there's folks here, for instance, worried about pedestrian access, and they're concerned about shoulders for bicycling. As you get to Damon Road, there's a, a lot of interest, and I don't know if this focus can be improved or not. I'm sorry, it's a little dark. Let's see if I can improve that focus. It's about as good as it's going to get. Um, you know, a lot of concerns, for instance, about uh, high traffic volumes at this intersection, the exit ramps coming in influencing that. There's absolutely no pedestrian crossing for any of the residences that are up here. We'd love to be able to con connect with some of this commercial. For some of the residences over here, who are seen walking along across the tracks and trying to get to there as well. And then, of course, King is a great spot for commercial use. Uh, folks are saying, hey, you know, maybe someday we can mix in other things. We can have forms of transit here. This intersection in particular is a little bit difficult from a traffic perspective, as I assume you all are aware. As you head a little bit south, we're at Barrett Street. Folks feel like a lot of this area is a little bit difficult to deal with. You know, bike lanes would be a great thing. The streetscape improvements to make it a little bit more walkable. And we'll get into the details of that in a moment would be helpful. You head a little bit further south, you start to see more commons, and there's a reason for that. More people live as you go further south along King Street and the neighborhoods that are nearby. There's a lot of folks talking about being able to provide access across this place to improve pedestrian crossings across King Street between the neighborhood and uh, both neighborhoods and to access the commercial. Uh, Finn Street and North Street are places where people have a particular focus and interest in making it work a lot better for them. And then, uh, you know, there's a lot of concerns about some of the exiting traffic, etc., and other locations as you get further north on the commercial corridor. Hit a little bit further south towards the intersection with Main Street. This is a loved and important intersection uh, for Northampton. Uh, and a lot of folks are loving the fact there's a lot of pedestrian volume. They know that you know, there may be better ways of getting the pedestrians around there. Many folks think that the wait at the intersection is too long, and yet others really, really love the fact that when the PED signal comes up, it's nothing but pedestrians taking on that intersection. A couple of folks have talked about you know, where might that Amtrak station go, and it's certainly important to try to get it in the core of your walkable downtown, while being cognizant of the fact that, yes, there will probably be commuter folks coming in, going off on three-day trips using the train, so we need to be able to park their cars. Um, and then as we head along Main Street, the concerns start to recognize that there's problems with the crosswalk, um, there's issues about how the travel lanes are a little bit confusing. You've got four lanes and it's actually enough pavement for five and even a little bit more sometimes. And while it's slow, it's a little bit confused where the crosswalks go across, pedestrians have to wait for one car to yield and wait for the next car to yield and hopefully the second car saw them and then they have to do it again on the other side of the street. And it just changes the character of getting across Main Street. Whereas walking along it is something I think everybody loves and folks come from out of town to go here. Some folks have talked about uh, doing reverse angle parking because it's extremely safe in all forms, uh, for, especially for cyclists, but also for just merging with motors and for pedestrian visibility as well. They talk a little bit about how else you might be able to encourage bicycling through this corridor. A lot of the pedestrian issues that are pointed out can be applied in many, many places. There's a lot of ideas here and thoughts that folks have had, uh, certainly from a pedestrian uh, perspective, where sidewalks are too narrow on King Street. And they're generally not much more than five feet, almost the entire length of the corridor. We'd like to see them a little wider, folks have said. Uh, concerns about accessibility at many of those crosswalks. Um, what you can do with the actual crosswalks themselves to make them more visible to motorists. And then, of course, trying to do as much as you can to increase pedestrian travel, make overall the environment more friendly for pedestrians. Um, before I want to skip up to bikes, for bikes, uh, making it overall more bike friendly, encouraging better bike crossings, more bicycle parking is something that lots of folks talked about. And a, and a nice comment here is, and it's an important point uh, Rick Chelman, our engineer, made it the other night, is that not every cyclist is the same. And, and the more we get kids feeling safer on their bikes and walking, the more we can change our communities in the future. 
Uh, but of course, there's other cyclists like me who feel fairly confident. There's cyclists who bike much more than me who are incredibly confident of uh, the way things are. Uh, for if you're a driver in this area, a lot of folks are saying, you know, it would be nice to maintain vehicle access, to maintain emergency vehicle access, to maintain the roadway capacity, worry about areas that have high accidents, for instance, but still keep the traffic flowing, especially on Main Street. A lot of concerns about, you know, roadway maintenance. If you're going to start making changes, how can we afford this and how what installations go in, how can they be maintained going forward. Um, folks would love to see fewer traffic lights on King Street, which is an indication that I think a lot of folks may want to even go faster than they can on King Street. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, and a few other thoughts about, you know, maybe we can incorporate transit. Everybody likes to see transit get that other car out of the way so you can go a little bit faster. Which is a good motivation for encouraging everybody else to get on the bus, even if you yourself don't think you will. Um, and then uh, there was also this uh, recognition of land uses and what really are promoting the right kind of uh, circulation in the downtown and what may not be. Uh, a lot of discussion about the zoning processes, folks are saying, you know, hey, could you bring in, uh, you know, fixed guideway transit. Uh, a lot of folks want green space, others recognize the value of residential density. Businesses are certainly very concerned about viability. Uh, but then there's other interesting thoughts about what the train station might be able to do and bringing in cafes and um, creating uh, dedicated opportunities for other modes of transportation to work and circulate through your downtown. Um, good enough from other folks' perspectives, which is a very common perspective in the planning process. So don't change anything. It's working. Don't go through this. Luckily, we're not actually going out there. Please be clear of this and changing a single thing any day soon. Uh, budgets are certainly tight. Uh, we also then collected data. This is just a, a legend of, of uh, some of the accident information along that corridor, basically saying wherever you see a bigger circle, there's accidents to be concerned about. So King Street has some problems as you go. Uh, this is not only high accidents, but it's also talking about the amount of volume on King Street, which is about 21,000 cars a day something also informing our design ideas for this. And again, a number of accident locations uh, throughout King Street, again, those volumes around 20,000 cars a day as you go. Uh, there's accidents as we approach Barrett here. Uh, as we head past Stop and Shop, there's regular reports. And these are all the points where there were at least five or more accidents over the course of the last, I think, three years. Is that right? Five, five years, right. Um, as you get closer to Main Street, uh, the volume of the accidents starts to be, de decrease a little bit. And you'll notice also the roadway volume as you get closer to Main Street decreases a little bit as well. Um, as you go along Main Street itself, there's also a number of crash locations it picks up again. And this is starting to be a little bit reflective of what folks were saying about Main Street where there is a lot of activity going on. There are a fair amount of conflicts at these different locations and there are crashes. I doubt any of these or very few of these are actual fatal crashes. They're probably, probably property damage and not all that bad, but they did warrant uh, police reports in all those locations. So one thing that we've been really um, cognizant of is that speed has a direct relationship to the amount of pavement that's out there. And while on Main Street, all that pavement, folks are still going slow because there's luckily a lot of pedestrians most of the time, King Street has a lot more problems in dealing with it. One of the most fundamental basics of transportation planning is recognizing that if you get above about 25 miles an hour, 30 miles an hour, you cross the point at which you'll be killed only less than half the time. Above 40 miles an hour, you have about a 1 in 10 chance of surviving a crash. Below 25 miles an hour, you'll almost always survive. Below 20 miles an hour, it's very rare to have a pedestrian fatality. So that range between 20 and 40 miles an hour, you see a very steep climb. And what that really does when you start to think about your streets is put in perspective what your land uses are. You know, do you want to live with your kids along a 40 mile an hour road where everybody's going to die? 
Or do you want to live with your kids on a 20 mile an hour road where you know that nobody might ever die? So those types of relationships to speed have a lot to do with what the land uses say. It also has to do very directly with the width of those streets. As soon as you get above a certain point, about 44 feet of curb to curb, you suddenly start to see the accident rate accelerate dramatically. And that is acknowledging speed in large part. What it's really saying is once you get to too many lanes, you begin to have some serious problems. And we talked the other night about an example of a place that really recognized the problems they had with their equivalent to King Street. In fact, many of them. This is metropolitan Seattle. And there they went through a process of road diving, which was to go from four lanes to three lanes, which afforded them, in the case, to add uh, bike lanes. But the extra capacity was turned into a turn lane. And what this was acknowledging is that today, even on King Street, if you're in that left lane, as soon as somebody wants to turn left, that left lane's not really a through lane anymore. It's more of a lane you need to get out of and only get in if you're turning left. And what that is effectively operating as is a center turn lane. It also so it happens that at 20,000 cars a day, there's no problem handling that volume on three lanes. But the capacity on King Street today is over 40,000 cars a day. So you have a highway built for a future with twice as many cars. If you want that, don't change it. But if you don't want twice as many cars, you don't want a highway section, you may want to think about what Seattle did. And what Seattle did on their equivalents of King Street is change their lane cross-section. In every single one of these cases, you'll see the daily volume increase after the change was made. This was areas where they continued to have growth over time. But the collision rates all dropped dramatically because the streets were safer and saner and more logical and less confusion for motorists, pedestrians, and bicyclists alike. And just three of those I'll show you here. Here's Greenwood Avenue. It's a commercial corridor with a lot of residential nearby. Probably not too dissimilar from Lower King Street, actually. And they have that nice center turn lane instead of four lanes. They have on-street parking there. Here we're up to uh, Dexter Ave, which is sort of like, for them, a transition zone to a, a higher volume area. And there, they've actually had so much success, they continue to see development, even in this economy happen on Dexter, where they went from four lanes to three. And this is one of those major commercial streets with over 20,000 cars a day. And again, they successfully dropped down to three lanes. So we take this into our minds a little bit when we look at <coughs> Upper King Street. And this view is near Barrett. Uh, we're just above. There's Cole Morgan up there, the concrete site. And the cross-section on King Street today is a very big cross-section. This is, uh, sorry, the label floated off the top. And I don't know what that blue thing is. It's some sort of computer error, but that's all right. This is, you get the idea of what the cross section is uh, here today. Um, I think technically these are maybe 11 foot lanes, but there's a lot of shoulder space. We're not exactly sure of the precise dimensions, but we're much closer on the curb to curb in the overall right of way. You've got businesses set back with front yard parking on much of King Street. Uh, you have a, a little bit of a green strip and then a, a five foot sidewalk. And if this were to also recognize the fact you've only got 20,000 cars a day and it wouldn't be a bad idea to reduce the crashes, we decided to come up with a cross section that installs a median that comes in and out, that shelters left turn pockets, may in some cases be that suicide lane, but hopefully has green plantings at times. There's a, an offset concrete strip on either side so if a vehicle happens to be stalled, emergency services could still get by, but the actual travel lane is only 11 feet. We've accommodated bicycles through this corridor in something that's called a cycle track. Um, we intentionally decided to put it near the vehicle lane with a little bit of an offset uh, of material simply because there's a real important need for motorists to be aware that the bicycles are there, but the raised curb is like Everybody loves it when it's installed. Whether you're a vehicular cyclist or not, as soon as that's there, it's like the bicycle expressway. But by putting it close to the travel lane, 
if a motorist is then going to turn into an active use on the side, they have seen the bicycles as they go, and they're not going to be surprised by them. You could also bring in the sidewalk to a point that makes sense. But this obviously allows you in that cross-section of King Street to still accommodate a nice landscape uh, buffer. We've kept the five-foot sidewalk here, but if someday you saw greater levels of density, it may not be a bad place to widen the sidewalk if there's ever and surely going to be a storefront retail spot. And this cross-section will work, as you'll see as we progress south, in areas that have a little bit more activity up on the street wall. Now as we start to get down, this is Finn, uh, this is Summer and North Streets, heading south again, a little bit further on King. And in this area, uh, this is the thing to know. We're starting to see residences filtered in. It's a bit of a different profile. Uh, further to the north, it was just big parking lots and big box type stores. And here, King is starting to change its character. Now one of the things that north of here we didn't have the advantage of was the mix of activities that starts to happen at this location. North of here, you have a whole bunch of standalone uses that sit out with their own parking lots in front of them. And this environment on Northern King is part of why there is traffic delay and why we thought it was important to accommodate left turn pockets. Because if somebody drives into a use, and in this example I'm driving and dropping off my daughter at school, I'm going to work, I'm driving back and picking her up, I drop her off at soccer at the end of school, I head over to the grocery store, come back after soccer practice, pick her up and head home. <coughs> On King Street alone, I've created all these turning movements. And all of those turning movements are part of the reason for congestion. As you start to head further south on King Street, you begin to get more of a mixed use nature. Streets intersect it better, there's more connectivity nearby, and the uses begin to be a little bit more clustered. And there's opportunities for what this example shows, a little bit more shared parking, not quite as much parking required up on King Street, and I can drive and park, my daughter can walk to school, I can walk to work, she can head to soccer practice on her own, I can stop at the grocery store on my way back to the car where I meet her, and then we can drive home. And those two turning movements represent a significant change in the amount of parking, land area, and in particular, trips and turning movements. Significantly less turning movements, which are the cause of traffic congestion. And of course, if you're at all paying attention to environmental sustainability, just with a different land use pattern, you've chopped the amount of pollutants that go up. So eventually, maybe Upper King will be there. Who knows? Middle King is already starting to be this way. And this is the cross-section today. Now, these buildings are, of course, pulled out of Google. Uh, today, you probably don't have more than one story in most of these cases. These are two-story buildings. But what's interesting to note about this cross-section, these are very narrow five-foot sidewalks. There's a little bit of a shoulder lane, and then the same four-lane cross-section. Five-foot sidewalks like that, really hard to support good retail, really hard to support the activity. And by looking at the cross-section, we were able to determine that you can make those sidewalks at least eight feet and provide the same kind of median. This is actually an older version of the median. It would be a little bit narrower with the three-foot concrete strips on either side when we finish up the drawing. But again, it's the same kind of profile as further to the north, except we've also got the on-street parking to allow that activity to have that short-term parking out front, which is another key determinant of retail. And so suddenly, it makes retail and mixed-use activity in this middle King section a little bit more viable. As you start to head even further south now, and we're down past summer, or actually summer slightly off the map, and we're heading down to the final stretch, Hotel Northampton, and here's Main Street. The street changes its profile again and gets even a little bit narrower. And in there today, where it's only about 55 feet from right, the whole right of way, um, it's not bad, but again, you have the same problem of the five-foot sidewalk. So we recognize what can we do to try to widen out those sidewalks as much as possible. And in this stretch, we've gone to the full 10-foot sidewalk that is usually a minimum for good retail. It's a minimum that you find on Main Street in most places. And it works. The key thing here is narrowing the travel lanes. Narrowing the travel lanes really helps to reinforce the idea of drive slowly, 
There's access, you can get through here, but hey, you know, you're heading into our community, don't go so fast. The truck can drive, just don't drive 40 miles an hour. If you did not move your curbs, if you did not spend millions of dollars on streetscape and you just go out with paint someday, we did recognize that you do have the room with the current profile on Lower King to actually put in bike lanes. And then, of course, it would be much easier to do this as you go further north as it widens out. While it's not great that you still have a five-foot sidewalk, it is good to provide bicycle capacity. In the long term, this previous slide, I'm not recommending it because you have excellent bicycle capacity on the new multi-use path that's only a half block to the east. But north of where that bicycle path intersects King, that's where we decided you definitely need the bicycle facilities and we recommended them as cycle tracks alongside King as you go north. But south of there, eventually, if people are driving slowly and respectfully, then you don't need a dedicated bicycle facility, which sometimes actually encourages people to drive a little bit faster. There's just another report that, that came out that says the same thing. And if you don't want to be on the street, if you don't like taking the lane, then you can go over to that bike path. But this still provides redundant capacity in the short term. <coughs> So another key thing about that location, um, this is the, we did a plan view of the transition between the, the sort of uh, uh, no on-street parking environment where we've got a cycle lane terminating at summer and where the cycle lane, uh, uh, sorry, cycle track starts up heading north on King. We went to this transition zone where there's current business access and we try to pick up the on-street parking. There's some great things that can happen in this zone, particularly at Finn, we're able to provide a dedicated crosswalk that signalized with a very short crossing distance that works into the signal that can come up on every phase. As you head a little bit further south, that's Finn again. Um, we still have this median environment, but it starts to change. And as we get to, to Summer Street right here, we recognize that the signal could change rather notably. In particular, North Street today queues up to market underneath the bridge causes a lot of problems. And we realize that while it's not ideal, there happens to be a slightly wider sidewalk on the north side of North Street. If we were to trim that back to five or six feet approximately, you have enough room for an extra lane, three narrow 10-foot lanes on North Street. And what that does is it allows two very unique things. One, you've almost doubled the capacity in North, which means the queues that spill onto Market Street go away. Secondly, you're able to split the left turn out of here simultaneously with the left turn out of Summer Street. And what that does is it allows a crosswalk right down the center of the intersection on a direct sidewalk connection through the neighborhoods to come up protected walk phase with no vehicle movements on it every single cycle. It's a really high level of pedestrian safety and, and accommodation. And then the rights would run and then the through traffic would run. Uh, we have a very fast model of this that I can pull up, which hopefully will play. This is why we have traffic engineers. So this is uh, just a quick uh, 2D simulation of that. On the right is the current operation. You can see this big queue of little vehicles backing up. On the left is with the extra turn lane. There's practically no queue. Of course, I had a traffic engineer, so he also looked at the timing on the Finn Street signal and completely changed that as well and made that signal work a little bit more efficiently just changing the priority on different approaches. So it's nice to be able to recognize that if you can make these trade-offs here, you can really help the intersection work better, but at the same time, and it's not drawn in here because this software doesn't accommodate it, you get that nice dedicated pedestrian crossing. And no, we did not kink the road to blow through Dunkin' Donuts, just the way the software happens to draw this, I'm sorry. The road would still actually come in this way. Uh, we control the, the volumes on there so that there isn't a two-way uh, traffic on summer, for instance. But we couldn't actually make the software misalign the roads when they're that close because the software thinks, I don't know, like we're in the rest of the country where nobody ever does this. But hey, we're in New England, so it happens. Is that the same speed? Uh, I mean, the traffic's going the same way for those Yes, yes. That was real time. So. As we get to the bottom of King Street, in this environment here, we're at the Hotel Northampton, the bottom of King Street, 
We're going to discuss this intersection too. There's necessarily a widening of lanes in order to process that intersection. But we started to draw this out and saw the need for storage to occur only past a point here when we tweak this intersection, as you'll see in a minute. And what that does is it allows us to put in a full 10-foot sidewalk, both in front of Hotel Northampton, as well as on the far side, where it's a little bit narrower than, I think it's 8 feet. We've also suggested that instead of the crosswalk be at the front door, where the stairs actually split, that the crosswalk be right in line from the registry to this nice pathway. And it happens to be a very good point to also put in a pedestrian refuge island, and then the cars spill into what is three lanes that are still needed at that signal. And another crosswalk back here is a great spot for where the driveway into the Hotel Northampton works. As you get into this signal, though, and this environment, this is really the, 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 the kicker. And I want to show you what we're doing here. Now, first and foremost, this is a lot of asphalt. It's a lot of asphalt. It's a very large environment that is hostile to pedestrians until the scramble phase comes up. And the scramble phase is on about a pedestrian delay level of service of F, which basically means you wait a really long time. And then you get to celebrate that you own the intersection, but you waited a couple minutes to do that. And that's not an extremely efficient way. It's not quite a couple minutes, but you waited a long time. And it's not quite an efficient way to run things when uh, today, all these cars leave and occupy the intersection for a while, and then these cars start to drive. You'll just notice. Go watch. After these cars have started to drive, look at the number of cars crossing there. The density of traffic has just gone away entirely. And as a result, there's a lot of lost capacity in this direction. You clear the queue really fast, but then there's not a lot of cars. And the same thing actually still happens in the other direction. There's so much time for this other direction on Main Street. You clear this queue, but then towards the end of the green, there's very few cars going through in terms of density. They may be going by every you know, half second or so, but when you've got a whole bunch of cars, you can move through in just one second. It's not as efficient of a way to process traffic. So what we did was we modeled this intersection. And this is the fun 3D thing. With a really changed configuration, what we've done is we've eliminated, um, we've eliminated redundant right turn lanes here and here. Which, which, and which here. street is which? I'm sorry, this is looking north on King. Yeah. This is uh, Pleasant, and that's Maine towards the bridge, Maine towards downtown. And what this simulation is proving, which, you know, there's numbers behind it more or less, but what the simulation is helping to prove is that you're able to significantly reduce the cycle length. And whether you have the pedestrians doing scatter, which the video won't do, or you have them walking concurrent, some people have said it wouldn't be bad to walk parallel to the traffic and make it even more efficient. Even if you don't, you've been able to reduce the cycle length a lot. And simply by doing that, processing just as many cars but on quicker intervals, you get better density and better use of this intersection. And that, as a result, allows you to move through just as many cars as you do today, but give the pedestrian a much greater percentage of that overall time in the intersection. You just make the space work more efficiently. So if I'm you were, not sure I understood what you did. What did you do that was different here? You'll see. That's how it looks on the computer simulation. My apologies that it's not the best way of looking at the intersection. This is what we've done here. And this is the better slide. In reality, and I don't have a zoom in of this, unfortunately. Um, there's an extra right turn lane here that's very frequently, if ever, used. Similarly, there's another one here. Um, and in here, we've maintained this right turn lane and kept it as a right throw. And essentially, in all of these locations, we've na narrowed up the sides of the intersection. By bringing in the corners of the intersection, we don't really move the stop bars up too much but we really change the amount of time that's required to get people uh, on foot through this intersection. By reducing the cycle length and by making it much easier to cross across, you can get the walk to come up much more frequently. Is it still a, um, a universal walk for everybody? It can run either way. It can run either way. Um, if you ran it as a uh, concurrent walk phase, which means that people would walk as cars are driving, 
which happens at lots of urban intersections, you would actually probably get a slightly higher level of efficiency. You'd certainly be able to get a shorter cycle length. As it works um, with the button, the cycle length gets lengthened when somebody hits the button to cross. But you can cross, you can get as good a level of service in both cases. So this really is about reclaiming a lot of that space, but not changing the vehicular capacity. There's still the two-lane merged throat on both sides, on all sides of the intersection as that tapers out of there. Um, you have significantly greater areas for pedestrians to wait before they cross, and of course, shorter crossing distances uh, from all corners. So that intersection dictates so much of the, the remaining design that exists on Main Street. And what we are able to determine is that the volumes, once you get past the queue storage and the merges that happen around this intersection, down here, do not warrant four lanes. This is a two-lane urban cross-section. And I'm not telling you I'm going to speed cars any faster than they move through there today. It's going to take you know, the same amount of time it takes to get through there, but I'm going to move just as many cars. And one of the key things of this design is that these crosswalks are significantly shorter, half the distance. These lanes, which are all big, still enable angle parking to occur. Reverse angle parking is the only kind of angle parking I will ever draw as a transportation planner or any of the engineers I work with. Head and angle is dangerous, 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 period. Reverse angle is safe for all users and actually easier to do than parallel parking. Um, I know this community is home of a lovely, uh, poorly conducted reverse angle parking experiment where they only changed a few spaces there. Should be done a little bit differently if you ever get to this again. Um, but what's also key here, and you can start to see it in this drawing, there's the old curb line where the cars are parked, back here. I'm not a, I'm not a uh, landscape architect, but I drew in a few you know, sidewalk cafes and uh, extra greenery. You can bring out the sidewalks on both sides, on average at least 15 feet, which is enough, 15 feet, is certainly enough to have a few tabletops if you wanted that. Or to put in nice bicycle parking or some other types of features. We've retained the nice bus stop in front here. Uh, we actually recognize that because there's two crossing desire lines here at Center Street, that it would be smart to raise the roadbed up to the level of the sidewalk, sort of a, a wooner type of effect. Uh, it's a slow speed street anyways and just makes it easier and safer for everybody to get across and lets the cars pay attention to what's going on. Could you explain reverse angle parking for just a minute? Mm -hmm. Because we did have like a... Like a yeah, reverse angle parking is, the, the basic maneuver is simple. You, just like parallel parking, drive up along the parking space, and then you look over your shoulder and you back in. Except, unlike parallel parking, you don't then have to worry about turning the wheel the other way, making sure your nose doesn't hit, making sure you don't hit the rear bumper. You've just, you're already in. Done. So the amount of time to back in reverse angle is like that. It has another huge advantage. In fact, it has a lot of advantages um, when you do reverse angle. First of all, as a driver, if this is my main street, and I want to head out, well, there's the oncoming traffic. Cyclists love it, because they won't get hit by somebody backing up blindly in the traffic, hoping that everybody yielded, because they were polite that day. Secondly, if you have kids, all the doors in your car open up, and none of those kids can go to the street. You've created walls. So all of your access is to the back. And then, of course, if you're somebody who's actually buying groceries in downtown Northampton, or maybe you've just picked up something really cool and you want to throw it into your trunk, your trunk's on the curb. Head and angle also has the disadvantage of requiring extra maneuvering space. So you need wider space, only about three or four feet, but just the way the wheels in a car are situated, if the wheels are out closer to the travel lane, you can not swing as much space. Whereas if you're up by the curb, you've got to back the rear end of that car all the way out into the travel lane before you can turn your wheels and then swing. So reverse angle has been used in, I don't know, about 100 or more cities in the United States. It's been in places like Washington, D.C. and Indianapolis for 40 years. There's been lots of places who've been incorporating it very actively and progressively. Go look at the, an aerial shot of our nation's capital. It's right there on the mall at the end of Pennsylvania Avenue. I don't know what number that is, but it's right there. Mike, then why do you think that more cities haven't incorporated it? I, all that sounds... <clears throat> 
auto automobile orientation. I mean, if you really think about it, our streets when they got paved were, in many cases, western towns where had sort of these wide areas for the stagecoaches to pull in. It was easy, okay, you're going to park the car. Nobody was thinking about that other mode of transportation. The car was the hottest, <coughs> hottest, greatest, sexiest thing around. So, hey, yeah, let's park those cars. I mean, it makes sense. It seems easier to get in. You're out of the traffic. Oh, we don't have to worry about backing up. There's not a lot of traffic. We can back up, and then traffic built up over time in all these cities, but we had installed head and angle parking in so many places, and it was really all about making it easier to drive except the backup phase. In the backup phase is, I'm going to just throw the dice and assume that nobody's going to rear end me. You're not in control. Whereas when you do reverse angle, it's just like parallel. You stop, you look in your mirror, is there somebody waiting for you to get in? Yes, now you can get in. When you get out, you look, you know when you can get out. I, I wasn't. I think all of that makes sense to right, me. You convinced right. me. That wasn't my question. My question was, why do you think that it's only that many cities that have? It's changing. It, again, like I say, it's been changing very actively over the course of the last ten years. More and more communities are putting in reverse angle parking, and just not even thinking about it and putting it in because of its benefits for safety. First and foremost, makes their streets a little bit skinnier. Great. Um, make shopping a little bit more convenient, great. But again, head and ankle had been the easy way to just quickly strike for cars when folks weren't really thinking about everybody else. You didn't have to think so much about everybody else when there wasn't so much congestion anyways. So now that we've got you know, congested streets, I mean, I, I guarantee Main Street Northampton, when they put in angle parking, didn't have more than you know, four or 5,000 cars a day. Now it's 15,000. Well, it did come up, I don't know how many years ago, I think Jason's right. The issue was it wasn't a very good experiment. The experiment was done on eight, 88 angle spaces today or so. I think that was the number I counted once. And they just shifted eight of them. So that's incredibly confusing. That's like an experiment, but not an experiment. So they're definitely not controlling all of your variables. So if you have just one lane of traffic going one way and one lane going the other, and someone has to stop. I'm not against the reverse angle. I'm just asking yeah. that somebody has to stop behind you. Wouldn't everybody be stopping all worse than what it is now for pedestrians? Um, it's probably going to be the same kind of an environment. What we have done, though, regardless of that, I mean, today, when a car backs out, you have to stop. The actual amount of time interfering with the traffic flow for reverse angle is short. Because when people are backing out, the amount of time it takes them to back out it, and move on safely is always longer than the amount of time it takes you to back in reverse angle. In fact, even parallel parking takes more time. But still, people don't want to wait in Northampton. They feel like they can squirt around to the other lane if there would happen to not be a car there or there's not a pedestrian at the crosswalk. will maybe try to get around that vehicle. And it's just like uh, parallel parking in any city you can kind of get by them or squeeze by them for a while. So all these lanes are designed to be 14 feet minimum from the center line to where the longest car would be parked reverse angle, which, you know, cars are six and a half feet wide. So folks will kind of squeeze around that. The, even the car doing the reverse angle maneuver doesn't need half of that space. So that continues westward on Main Street. All this is reverse angle parking. Uh, again, there's that center street, Wooner fee thing I talked about. Again, notice the size of the sidewalk. It's really great to know you do not have so much volume that you can't go to two lanes in your downtown. Now, if everybody just decided that we're going to give up on shifting folks out of their cars overall, and you're doing anything but that with your bike paths in downtown, with increasing utilization of, uh, you know, that old two-footed mode of transportation and even transit, you're probably not going to see major traffic growth in your downtown. In fact, there isn't a community in all of Massachusetts that I'm aware of that has seen their background growth rates ever come into fruition. In fact, in Cambridge, near where I live, their traffic has actually slowly declined, even during the boom of the economy and all the new housing and business that went into Cambridge, because more and more people were choosing to live in that environment and not drive. So hopefully, you know, if, if you added another 4,000 cars a day, you're at about 15,000. If you went to 19,000, 
then you're at a threshold where this may not really work. But at 15,000, you're at this great line of defense. You can actually make this work. And the working is, again, pretty dramatic in terms of width. We've, you know, clearly, this is a, a large plaza where, what's that street coming in? Remind me? South. 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 No, it's not South. It's Old South. Old South. Old South. Oh, so Harold's is right there. So you come up uh, Old South, and you, you know the stop bar on the crosswalk today is here. It would I didn't draw it for whatever reason. In the future, it would be up a little bit further. We've provided a, a dedicated bus stop just before the angle parking picks up, so there's a nice, clear downtown bus stop location. Um, and then, again, the width of this. This location in particular is problematic in the downtown. If you're somebody crossing across here, it's very difficult today. So what we're suggesting here is actually making that a very wide crosswalk, maybe with textured pavement. It doesn't need to be raised, um, but it's aligned with one spot in particular where I really would recommend the change, is this alley one-way driveway to your parking. It's really easy to get your parking lot from the back street, um, but very few people use this and I would argue you probably don't need it in capacity. This is a beautiful spot. Hang some nice light bulbs across the top, and put down some tables, and you've got some nice outdoor cafe, even if the business doesn't use it. But that whole connection sort of changes the environment here and connecting into the front door of City Hall. Um, and here's a, I'm sorry, as we move west, here's a little bit of a better picture of that. So you've been able to bring these curbs out significantly and create really nice public spaces there. But again, you're being able to control where the traffic goes, make clear expectations. Uh, I have stood out here before, at this location before, and had no fears about vehicles hitting me, but that's just because I'm watching where the cars go. Nobody else would normally stand there. This is the closest sidewalk today. So being able to really recognize where things go, this curve is to allow the bus that swings down there to be accommodated. What's the change in parking? I haven't done it, but it's an increase. I don't know what the actual number is. Mostly because we're able to make this reverse angle parking through here, where today it's just parallel parking. Uh, but in general, throughout the rest of the corridor, uh, another thing also on this side street, um, today it's just angle parking. You have enough width to do parallel parking on both sides, which will bump up the supply there a little bit as well. Only about 40 to 50 percent, but that's a nice increase in, in terms of the number of spaces there. And the lane in between is 17 feet, which is the same amount of distance that you would find in any parking garage that you could go blown for. Um, this is actually the CAD drawing of that uh, plaza space that would be out front. We just made sure that the bus turning radii and all could work uh, on that plaza design. So as we start to head to the very tail end of Main Street, we're getting up to South and uh, State. Again, we're dealing with this intersection and how it's been defining your downtown. And the plan as we go in this direction is still recognizing two lanes. There's this great crosswalk where we really made it much, much shorter with curb extensions. But again, at Masonic, that defines the change in the character of the roadway. And in this intersection, let me see if this is the right plan. Yeah, in this intersection today, you know, you've got a ton of asphalt, quite obviously. And what we tried to do in this plan is still have the two functioning approach lanes that you can handle on two, uh, two there, two receiving lanes that then merge uh, into your main street. And you still got the bus stop here. But what's key about this intersection is trying to make it as compact as possible, but what we've also acknowledged is you still technically need two through lanes, a dedicated left turn lane, and a dedicated right turn lane, just like you do today. <coughs> and the reason is because of the proximity of West Street to State and Elm. Now, we didn't try and do any more of a dramatic alignment change because you'd be blowing through buildings and parcels and what have you to possibly create more of a confused piece of pavement than you have today. But what we did do was move West Street a little bit further away, and we moved this stop bar, which is currently here, a little bit further down, and this storage distance goes from 200 feet to 240 feet, and as a result, you have just the right amount of additional queue storage to actually see the level of service at this intersection drop. We get rid of the dedicated pedestrian crossing that goes to the middle, and if you've ever been out there, it's the scary left-hand turns and you're walking down the middle of it, 
and created a more rationalized set of four crosswalks on the outside. But there's a really key feature here, which is that the right turn is now, in, at this point, in its own channelized yield lane, slip lane, to continue on to South Street. This is a raised crossing. They've been doing these in Boulder to great success. And the raised crossing essentially says if you're turning right, you're slowing down, yielding to those pedestrians, and then continuing. And so a pedestrian has the right to go out and then wait on this island for the signals to cross. And as a result of taking those right turns out of this point and putting them back here, when this, when this traffic is moving, um, when this traffic is moving on its phase out of Elm Street, this crosswalk comes up fully protected again. Today, that crossing is a long, pretty scary crossing. And due to the heavy right, people just don't feel safe. I had somebody else mention that today. So here, heavy yielding due to the raised crossing. And then here, the crosswalk is always on fully protected um, uh, walk mode when the traffic is coming down the hill. It really gives it a very, very long crossing phase as a pedestrian. We actually did the same treatment on the other side, though the volumes are not really there, but it's a, it's a good treatment to do as well. And again, you have this area to wait. Beyond that, the rest of, uh, we did a little bit of the design up uh, Elm Street. There's plenty of room to add on street parking in a stretch where it doesn't exist today, to still have the channelization for the left-hand turns. And as you also notice, to carry a bike lane all the way through, down, and into Main Street, where it would then taper and blend in uh, with the rest of the slower speed traffic on Main Street. Sir, uh, did you manage to shorten the cycle of the big intersection of Route 9 and Route 10? Right here? Yes. Yes. I don't know what the number is on front. I'm sorry. I don't have the data file in front of me, but we did shorten it. And that's part of what the shortening is really the big advantage to the fact that I think the level of service actually improved. I'm not going to say firmly that we improved the level of service, but the added queue storage um, and then the shorter uh, cycle length should probably do that. So um, we also did this little picture thing of what the intersection might look like once before. Um, as it turns out, this isn't quite possible. The only thing that it, you know, we actually got rid of the right turn lane. Uh, but we're suggesting now instead channelizing it. Uh, the other key thing I failed to mention is that under both this scenario and of course what we actually drew, uh, we've been able to add a dedicated left turn lane on south, which helps with the queue coming in on Route 10 as well. So there's the folks who are turning left are in their own space and people can get by more clearly. It's not an ideal intersection alignment by any means, but a little bit of tightening up this approach and pointing folks to where they're supposed to go goes a long way. So that's generally the end of my presentation. Um, your thoughts and, and your comments and, and your ideas are certainly more than welcome. And I'll try to go back through slides and give me some patience if there's some particular uh, areas that you're concerned with or have any particular comments on.